Well, today we're closing out a series we've been in across the last five weeks called Relation Trips. I know uh, it's kind of a bummer that it's ending. All good things must come to an end. And man, we pray that this series has been an encouragement to you, has challenged you in your relationships of every single kind, parent-child relationships, marriage, dating, work life, in-laws, social media. We're all in relationships on some level. And so this series has been addressing the fact that relationships can be hard, all right? They can be dangerous. They can trip us up. They can cause difficulties in our life. For many of us, the biggest source of tension in your life right now has something to do with some relationship in your life. And so in this series, we're seeing the dangers, but we're also looking at God's design for the relationships in our life. And if you've been a part of this series, you may have realized that while we've called it a relationship series, and it is, and it'll continue to be that today as we kind of land the plane, uh, it's not been uh, five easy ways for you to fix your spouse. We've not given you, um, hey, here's three things you can do to fix the crazy in-laws or the coworker or the boss that you don't like or the classmate that you can't talk. Here's, here's three ways to fix them. It's actually been a whole lot more about here's how you can fix you. Here's how God can work in your life to fix you. Because let me just kind of open us up today in, in our closing finale with this breaking news. You can't fix the people and the relationships in your life. No matter how hard you try, no matter how many Facebook posts you share, you can't fix them. But the truth is today, you do have control over you. And we have found, man, the power, and when you allow God to work in your life and through your life, the way that it can begin to impact and change the relationships in your life. One more thing just for us to kind of center ourselves around before we open up God's Word today is that a lot of you, as you've joined us over the last few weeks, when you've thought about, you've prayed for, you've maybe even taken action in a relationship in your life, whether it's marriage, dating, family, work, whatever that looks like, you've put some of these things into practice. You're like, man, I'm walking them out. But can I just share with you today that, man, relationships often, rarely are fixed overnight We've all got some jacked up relationships in our life, and can God redeem them? Absolutely he can. Is it going to happen overnight? Probably not. Relationships require hard work. They require constant obedience. They require continual surrender. And so, man, the hope of this series has just begun to get, has just uh, been to give you a foundation, a catalyst, a starting point for you to begin to think about, God, what do you need to do in me so that you might begin to change the relationships around me. And so realize today, man, relationships require work. They don't change overnight, but that God is present and he is faithful and he can redeem even the most difficult places in your life. Well, if you have a copy of scripture, turn with me today to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 is where we will be. It'll take us a little bit to get there, um, but that's where we will ultimately land today as we add on one final kind of characteristic theme to our relationship series. And today we're going to center around the theme and the characteristic of honesty, that every healthy relationship, every healthy relationship must be centered on Honesty. We've talked about a lot of important characteristics over the last few weeks, but today, I believe, is going to be one of the most important in the entire series. And so, as we've done all series long, we're going to talk about the dangers and the design. The dangers and the design. If you're new to the series, the dangers that we're going to address first are what happens when we do relationships under our thoughts, our power, maybe a little bit of the culture sprinkled in, what we believe is best. We're going to ultimately see today that the dangers picture is not a very beautiful picture. But then we will open up God's word to see that there is a design. There is a way that God calls us to walk in honesty in our relationships. And it's a much more beautiful picture than when we try to do it by ourselves. And so today we'll look at the dangers and the design of walking in honesty in our relationships. And I'll just say at the beginning today that, man, this is one of those buckle-up messages, okay? Because today, I believe, could be a heavy word for some of us today. Um, Whether you realize it or not, maybe today's God's going to speak something very directly into your life around this idea and this truth of honesty. And I believe today, if you'll receive it with an open heart and open mind to say, God, I do want to do your design in my relationships, I believe God could do a true and real work in your life today. So I want to look at three dangers, then we're going to look at three designs out of the truth of God's word and ultimately let those things change us to look more like him. So the first danger of relationships done outside of God's design in the area of honesty, we're going to define it this way, is that they are incomplete 
and dissatisfied. Relationships outside of God's design in the area of honesty are incomplete and they are dissatisfied. Let me prove that to you. According to some recent research, 60% of adults admit they can't have a 10-minute conversation without lying. And in that 10-minute conversation, people lie on average three times. So if you're having a conversation with a coworker tomorrow for 10 minutes, just realize three things they're saying you can't believe. All right, 60% of adults. We lie to everyone. Statistics show 86% of people admit to lying to their parents. Kids, we're watching. All right, 75% of people lie to their friends. 73% of people lie to their siblings. And 69% of people own up to lying to their spouse. We lie to everyone. And we'll lie about just about everything. People lie on their resumes. We lie on social media. Hello. We lie about weekend plans. We lie to the doctor. We lie to teachers. We lie to make other people happy. And we lie to make ourselves appear more likable. We as a people struggle with being honest. And all of this ultimately reveals that we are incomplete and dissatisfied. Now, we may not admit that out loud, But the reality is our dishonesty points to the truth that we are incomplete and dissatisfied. Mark Twain once said, a man is never more honest than when he says, I am a liar. See, because we have sinful hearts, dishonesty is a struggle for so many people. And a relationship that lacks truth is a relationship that is ultimately incomplete and dissatisfied. Now, some people think that they can lie, can deny the truth, can deny reality, and somehow that would lead to a level of satisfaction. If I can deny away what is there, then maybe that will lead to satisfaction. So people leave out small pieces of information with their spouse, or they intentionally mislead people at work, or they tell bold-faced lies to their friends or coworkers. But as we'll see today, the liar is never fully satisfied. They're never fully satisfied. See, the first danger today when we do relationships our way, the danger is that they become incomplete and dissatisfied. There's a second danger today of relationships outside of God's design in the area of honesty, and that is that they are marked by conflict. They're marked by conflict. How many of you, and uh, you can be honest today, all right, because this is a message about honesty. Um, in, the, in the stream today, you just kind of throw your emoji in there. If you ever, at any point in your childhood, told a little lie, big lie to your parents, okay, anybody willing to do that? If you didn't raise your hand, all right, you're a liar and the message is for you today. Um, you know, we all did that. Of some level, there was something that we probably weren't fully truthful with about our parents, whether it was a grade that we make, how we got in trouble at school, what we really did at our friend's house, um, how late we stayed out, whatever. Whatever that was, and do you remember what happens when you told that lie, maybe even as small as it may have seemed in the moment? Then you spent so many days and hours and weeks after that doing your best to cover it up, right? Like for some of you, you had to make sure that your parents didn't talk to your friend's parents because your friend's parents might tell your parent what was really true. Or you had to make sure that your parent somehow didn't get the invitation to the meet the teacher night because your teacher might tell what was really true. Or maybe for some of you, you might have forged mom and dad's name on those signed papers that went home. I'm preaching to somebody today, all right? Man, that's the reality. You remember that? And we had to lie and tell another lie to cover up that lie and another lie to cover up that one. And we spent so much time, all right, so much time trying to cover up what was not really true, living in deceit. And the reality is, church, hear me, it's the same way in relationships where honesty is not a priority. They are constantly filled with conflict because we're constantly trying to hide something. We're trying to hide something. I talk with a lot of couples whose marriages are not in great places. They're in the danger area. Can I just be real with you today? I don't remember talking to a single couple where there was not some level of dishonesty present in the conflict. Whether it was one spouse or the other was hiding a secret habit or sin, whether it was one spouse or both of them mishandling money and not being honest with The other spouse, it was one spouse or another who had a secret online relationship with somebody from the opposite sex from work or from an old flame. And dishonesty 
is almost always present in the middle of conflict. And it's the same way for the relationships in our life. It's not just in the area of marriage, but teenagers lie to their parents about what really went on at their friend's house or what they're really doing online. As employees, they lie to bosses about why they were really late to work or why they really couldn't get the project done. Or friends lie to each other about how they feel about each other. And in the moment, it seems like we're trying to protect ourselves from conflict. But I'm telling you today that ultimately it's only leading to conflict, both internally in us, because then you got to hide it, and it ultimately leads to greater conflict when the truth is finally revealed, and the truth is always ultimately revealed. Scripture would tell us this, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3. It says, those who guard their lips, or those who speak honestly, they preserve their lives. But those who speak rashly or dishonestly will come to ruin. You see, relationships that fail to practice honesty are filled with conflict because they're always working to hide something. Filled with conflict, incomplete and dissatisfied. There's one last final part of this danger when we do relationships our way in the area of honesty, and that is defined by the word destruction. Destruction. See, we've all seen the after pictures of when a tornado sweeps through a town, a city, a community. Cars are flipped over, homes, businesses are destroyed, trees are snapped in half, and the tornado always leaves a path of destruction. You see, it's the same way when we fail to make honesty a priority in our life and in our relationships. It always leaves a path of great destruction. We lie to people so that we think they won't be disappointed in us. But ultimately, dishonesty and deception always produces destruction. That's for somebody today. Dishonesty and deception always produces destruction to you and to your relationship. See, lies create mistrust. They create hurt. And maybe you know somebody in your life right now, you could call their name, who's lied so much across the years that you don't know what to believe. You you don't believe anything that they say now. Psychologists tell us that it's possible to lie so much that it creates an illness in us of a pathological path. We, We begin to believe the lies that we've told. We begin to live in that as if it is a reality. You see, lying is destructive to us personally, but lying is also destructive to us relationally. Lies and dishonesty have ended marriages, closed down businesses, created family turmoil, ended friendships, and created years and sometimes decades of tension between parents and children. See, perhaps some of you, you carry scars in your life right now, deep wounds in your life, because somebody was not honest with you, or perhaps you weren't honest with somebody else, and it creates real pain in our life, real destruction The great pastor Charles Spurgeon once said, lying and wicked talk stuffs our pillows with thorns and makes life a constant whirl of fear and shame. Maybe that's what your life can feel like right now because of dishonesty. We see we label them as white lies. But when we begin to open up God's truth over and in our lives, we begin to realize there is no such thing as a white lie. Every lie produces destruction. Every lie hurts someone and something. And it creates years, months, weeks of time to rebuild the trust that is broken, the destruction that comes because of a life of dishonesty. Lying is wrong every single time. And it causes destruction every single time. See, the danger picture, as I told you, is it's not a beautiful picture. And it's filled with conflict. It's marked by destruction. It's incomplete and dissatisfied. And men, if you are honest today as you join us from wherever you may be, that looks like a lot of relationships or maybe a big relationship in your life because dishonesty has been present. And maybe today God's using this moment, this time to begin to pull back the blinds to reveal what's caused the destruction, why there's so much conflict. You see, that's the danger side of things. But because God is a masterful builder, because he's a redeemer, 
because his design is better. He gives us the truth in how we can walk in relationships his way. It's a much better picture, but it requires obedience and trust and surrender to him to do relationships his way. And so I want to begin to dive into God's word. Not to leave us in the danger, but to help us to see the hope of the design. There's three parts of this today that I want us to unpack from 1 Peter 3 that I think could encourage you in your marriage today, in that parent-child relationship, at your workplace, maybe in the secret um, lies that you've been living in. God has hope for you today. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Pick up with me. You'll begin to see it on the screen as well. It says, finally, all of you be like-minded. Be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but on the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Peter gives this encouragement. We'll stop right there. He gives this encouragement, which coincidentally covers so many of the characteristics we've talked about. Over the last few weeks, it covers love, and it covers unity, and purity, and humility, And Peter sets the table with these verses, and then he begins to speak very directly towards this characteristic, this essential part of honesty. Look at verse 10, 1 Peter 3. It says, For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. Verse 11, They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You see, these verses were first written by a guy by the name of David in Psalm 34. David was a guy who knew the benefits and he knew the destruction of living a life of honesty and of dishonesty. And Peter takes these words from the Old Testament and he plants these truths here in 1 Peter 3 and he begins to lay out what I believe we could see today as God's design for honesty in your relationships. And the first characteristic today is that relationships done God's way, God's design in the area of honesty is they are fulfilled and content. They are fulfilled and content. While relationships done under the danger, are incomplete and dissatisfied. When we find God's truth and we begin to walk in it, relationships can be fulfilled and they can be content. Verse 10, we read it. Peter says, whoever would love life and want to see good days. That's what Peter wrote. In this phrase, Peter's literally saying, whoever desires to have a good life, do this. Now, I don't know anybody who wakes up on the daily and says, man, I really hope today stinks. Like, I'm going to do my best to make today just horrible. Like, we we don't do that. Scripture says, if you long to know a happy, content, satisfied life, then do this. Let your lips speak truth. Be a person of integrity and honesty. That phrase, you want to see many good days, means that you would live a content life. So he says, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Peter says, don't involve yourself in trouble because that in return makes this life a burden. It makes it a weight. Now, the word deceit um, that's used there in verse 11 in the original language, it carries the meaning to bait. It's referring to like a hook or a bait or a trap. And we begin to see today that when we deliver with deceit, we're making a deliberate attempt to mislead, to hook or to trap someone else by telling lies. That's why in the marketing world, there's the term bait and switch, where a price is offered that's too good to be true. And scripture says today, bait and switch is not God's design for relationships in your life, but honesty is what he calls us to. You see, relationships are not where we tell half-truths to our spouse to hope that they don't get angry with us. Or we tell our parents one thing and then do another. Or we deceive our boss or our friends so we can get what we want. No, in relationships done under God's design, honesty is the only choice. It's the only route. And as a result, Scripture says we begin to love life. We live in relationships that are satisfied, that are content with the truth that we speak. 
You see, it's impossible to love life and see good days when you're constantly living with the weight of dishonesty. It's like taking a 100-pound backpack, throwing it on your back, living the whole next week with it on your back, doing everything with that backpack on your back, weighted down with 100 pounds, and acting like everything's normal. It's not. And hear me today. God did not design you. He didn't design you to live with the weight of deceit and dishonesty in your life. That's not his design, but he has a better design. He created us to have a new heart and a new mind that chooses honesty in our relationships. Look at this from God's word. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9. Paul very specifically says, do not, what? Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self. It's the exchange of old for new. You've taken off your old self with its practices, and you've put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. Think about this moment for me that we've all experienced. When you go to the doctor, what is one of the first things that the doctor asks to see? If you might be sick, they say, stick out your tongue, right? Stick your tongue out so I can see, right? They want to see what's happening. Why do they do that? Because your tongue can often be an indicator when something's not right in your physical body, when something is sick. And I believe perhaps today God could be looking at some of you saying, let me see your tongue. Because your tongue is an indicator of what could be wrong deeper inside of you. Your willingness and your obedience to speak truth or to not speak truth reveals the condition of your heart that then begins to affect the relationships of your life. You'll never have a healthy heart. You'll never have healthy relationships when dishonesty is what comes out of your mouth. Yet, when you walk in truth, you will find fulfillment and contentment, both personally and relationally. See, God's design is better. His design in the area of honesty produces fulfillment. It produces contentment in the relationships in our life. Scripture keeps going, though, and I want to give us a second characteristic. Under God's design is that our relationships are defined by being peaceful. They're peaceful. Now, many relationships are defined by conflict. That was the danger, okay? But God has a greater design of peace. Verse 11 that we read a while ago, 1 Peter 3, it says, Turn from evil and do good. Turn from evil and do good. Now, this idea of turning from evil is an intentional choice. It's not what you do by default, but it's an intentional choice by all of us. As long as you walk in evil or dishonesty, don't be surprised when evil and dishonesty is what comes out of you. See, perhaps for some of you today, the, the most obedient next step that you can begin to take is to remove yourself from the things and the people in your life that cause your heart to lean into dishonesty. Like for some of you, it means that you need to block somebody on social media. Or you may need to turn off one of your social media outlets. It means that you need to maybe disconnect from some of the entertainment, the music, the shows, whatever, that you're absorbing in your life. It may mean that you need to disconnect from a friend group, that extracurricular group at school, that work group that just has a tendency to stretch the truth. And the longer you hang in it, the more it's going to happen with you. You see the old truth. Or the old adage has a lot of truth in it. When garbage comes in, garbage is what will come out. And today God says begin to unite your life in environments with people in relationships where honesty is a priority. So that peace is what comes out. You can't expect to surround yourself with dishonesty and then hope peace is the result. It just doesn't work that way. Now in verse 11, Peter writes, seek peace and pursue it. If you joined us a few weeks ago as we talked about unity together, we saw that there's a call from God's word on those who are in Christ to be peacemakers. The call on us is to pursue peace just like Jesus did with us. And so today that aligns perfectly with this call to be honest. You see, one of the greatest ways to maintain peace in your relationships is to be a person of truth, which means you know the other side of the coin. One of the greatest ways to cause conflict, to have continual conflict in your marriage, in your dating relationship, at your workplace, is to be a person of dishonesty. God says today, seek 
peace and pursue it. The New Living Bible translates verse 11 this way. Listen to it. It says, try to live in peace even if you must run after it to catch and hold it. In other words, chase it at all costs. Pursue honesty. Pursue truth. There is no value that can be put on relationships that live in peace, and peace can only be found when we live in truth. A pastor friend of mine uh, once said, lies are clean on the front end. You get away with it, but it's messy when it's made known. Truth sometimes can be messy on the front end, but it actually leads to clean, free living on the backside. The psalmist would say it this way, Psalm 141 verse 3, he prayed, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. See, church, God has made our mouth the doorway of our body. It reveals a lot about our head, our heart, and our mind. And the doorway today, for some of us, is full of dishonesty and deception. And the psalmist knew the power the importance of praying because of the struggle that was inside, God, would you set a guard over my mouth? And for some of you today, the greatest step that you can take is begin to pray to the God who designs relationships and who designed you. God, would you put a guard over my mouth, over the doorway to my body? Because God, I know what's coming out right now is not peace. It is not truth. It is not honesty. And it's not producing relationships in your design. So God, put a guard over me. You see, when we do relationships under God's design, we can know peace. We can find fulfilled and content relationships. But there's one final characteristic that I believe God desires for all of us to know and experience. And that is that under God's design, our relationships can be blessed. We can know the power of a blessed relationship. While dishonesty opens the door to destruction, honesty opens the door to blessing. Write that down. Honesty opens the door to blessing. Now, in verse 12 that we read a while ago from 1 Peter 3, Peter speaks about two different groups of people. He speaks about those who are righteous or those who walk in honesty. Then he speaks about those who are evil Or we could say today, those who walk in dishonesty or deception. I want to take a moment to see God's response to those two different groups of people. Because I believe today that even on the other side of that screen, those two groups of people exist. You're in one group or the other. You're walking in righteousness and truth is the practice of your life. Or you're walking in unrighteousness. And dishonesty is just something that flows out of you. And God has a response to both of those crowds. I want us to see it today to encourage us and to challenge us. First, I want to look at the second group that Peter mentions. Those who do evil, or we could say those who live dishonestly. Okay, Verse 12 of 1 Peter 3 says, The face of the Lord is against those who do not walk in truth. Now, what does that mean? That the face of the Lord is against those. It means that God's anger... God's displeasure is on those who fail to live with honesty. See, one of the Ten Commandments is do not lie. God cannot tolerate dishonesty. Not only is that one of the Ten Commandments, but Scripture would go on to lay this out. Look at this truth with me from Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. Here's what it says. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Verse 17. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out what? Lies. And a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Scripture says of the six things that God hates, dishonesty are two of them. God hates lying because God hates sin. See, God cannot tolerate sin. And although we may believe that overbilling a client, looking the other way at work, telling a white lie to our parents, or fibbing on our kids' age at the restaurant, while we may believe it's not that big of a deal, 
God says today, it's a big deal because it's not honesty. And God designed you, he created you to know the blessing that can only come from walking in a life of honesty. And we have to get to the place where we begin to realize that lying is wrong every single time. See, Galatians says this about God. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap, there's our word again, destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, God's design, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Listen to me, church. If nobody else knows and you think nobody else will find out, God knows. He knows. And he says, when you sow dishonesty, you will ultimately reap destruction. And 1 Peter says that God's face would be turned against you and against your relationships. Scripture says the enemy, the devil, is the master of what? Deceit. He's the father of lies. And anytime we walk in dishonesty, we are ultimately not walking in a life that is rooted from God. And God cannot handle, he hates dishonesty because of where it comes from and what it does to his kids. God cannot tolerate dishonesty, and because of that, he turns his face away from those who do not walk in truth. And Scripture goes deeper. Not only does it say that God turns his face towards the dishonest now, but it points towards God's face in eternity. Read with me from Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. Look at what Scripture says. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children, verse 8, but the cowardly the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars. They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now listen to me. I don't share that with you to scare you today. Fear's not a great tactic. But I share that with you today for you to own and understand the weight of when we walk in dishonesty, that God takes lying, the small things, the big things, the seen things, the unseen things. He takes those seriously. And today he calls you to be a person of truth, to be a person of truth. Remember Peter said that there were two groups. There was those who walk in evil or walk in dishonesty, but there's a second group, and that's those who walk in righteousness, those who pursue truth with their lives. I want you to hear God's response to that group, his design over that Okay, Peter says in verse 12, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and he hears their prayers. In other words, for those who walk in dishonesty, God does not turn his face from them, but God turns his face towards them. And scripture would go on to tell us that they find blessing. Proverbs 12, verse 22, it says, The Lord detests lying lips. But here's the good news today. Don't miss it. But he delights in people. He delights in people. The Lord, the creator, he delights in people who are trustworthy. Scripture says God takes special notice of those who walk in truth when it's easy, when it's not. And he has a special affection for those who walk in honesty, in the small things and the big things, in the seen things and in the unseen things. Not only does God watch over them, but more importantly, Peter says, God hears their prayers. That truth tellers, those who walk in righteousness and honesty, they can cry out to God confidently on the mountaintop in the valley, in the victory, in the battle. They can call out and he hears them. For some of you today, you've been wondering, I mean, why does it feel like those prayers that I'm throwing up aren't being heard? Why does it feel like God's not answering? Why does it feel like God's not responding and he's not hearing? And today he's looking into your heart and your mind to say, you're not walking in truth. You're not walking in my design. You're not in align, alignment with my purposes for your life, which are to be a person of truth. So what does this mean for us today? What does this mean for somebody today who goes, that's me? Man, I've been walking in so much dishonesty. I've been living in my flesh. I've been tripping in the dangers of dishonesty. 
What is, what is your response today? How do you break a dishonest heart? For some of you over the last just little bit, man, the living word of God has spoken into your life, wherever you are and whenever you're joining our gathering. And he's beginning to reveal some brokenness, some dangers inside of you. And right now you're sitting there going, man, what, what do I do with this? How do I walk out of this? When I give you some action steps for you to take. Okay, we believe the living word not only speaks to us, it gives us information, but it leads us to, to live differently. And so here's the first step for somebody today is to admit to God that you've got it wrong. Admit to God that you've got it wrong. Own the fact that you haven't been a person of truth. In other words, stop lying to yourself that you're not a liar. Own it. The first step of repentance is owning where we've fallen short. Okay, the second step for you today is to trust God and allow him to work in you and for you. You trust him and allow him to work in you and for you. You know what's at the root of every single lie? Fear. It's fear that God won't come through. It's fear that you've got to protect yourself. You've got to provide for yourself. You've got to come across a certain way. You've got to uphold a certain image. And fear lies at the bottom of all of that today. Can I tell you something? God did not create you to live with a spirit of fear. You no longer have to lie to protect yourself, to provide for yourself, to make yourself belong or be accepted. Listen to me. God works on your behalf. And today, for some of you, the best way to begin to live a life of honesty and truth is to let God be God and you get off the throne. God today wants you to be a person of truth, but that requires you trusting him and allowing him to work in you and for you. And the final step today is that you would replace your dishonest heart with a truth-filled heart. That you would replace the dishonest heart that maybe you've been living with, that you are living with, with a truth-filled heart. And listen to me, by a truth-filled heart, I don't just mean a person that tries to speak honestly. But I'm talking about somebody who lives with the capital T truth at the center of who they are. Because you see, here's what scripture would say about Jesus. John chapter 14, verse 6. Look at it on the screen. Jesus answered, I am the way, and I am the what? I'm the truth. It's the essence of who he is. He came to be truth, to show truth, and to speak truth. I'm the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. But Scripture goes on to tell us the power of truth, of who Jesus is, of the essence that he gave to us. John 8, 31 says this, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, if you're into my design, if you want to know what I'm saying about your life and the relationships in your life, then you would be really my disciples, and then you would know the truth, and the truth would set you what? Free. The truth is what sets you free. Jesus is truth, and it is only the truth of Jesus continually, daily, through his word, through his people, through the gathered church, through worship, through the renewing of your mind. It's only when that truth is alive in you that you can be a person of truth. And as we've said all series long, listen to me, church, you'll never be the spouse the significant other, the parent, the child, the grandparent, the aunt, the uncle, the coworker, the boss, the extended relative. What you'll never be who God calls you to be in those relationships on your own. It only happens when you allow truth, capital T, Jesus, to sit at the center of your life, and then you daily choose to align yourself to his design and his purposes for your life and the relationships in your life. And God has a calling on all of us today, and that is to be a person of truth. And for some of you today, you need to acknowledge that relationships are hard. Maybe for you, you would say today, honesty's hard. Man, today God's calling you not to just hear what he's saying to you. Maybe to even feel convicted, but he's calling you to begin to replace the dishonesty in your life with a life of truth, a life of righteousness that knows the blessing and the peace and the fulfillment and contentment that comes from doing things under his design. And so, man, as a church family, we want to resource you and point you towards what is truth so that you begin to build a foundation of truth in your life. 
And so as we've offered throughout this entire series today, man, if God's spoken very directly to you in this area of honesty, maybe that you, you acknowledge today, man, I'm owning it, that I've gotten it wrong. It's a struggle for me. Then, man, we would love for you to use the resources that we've created for this week. You can just simply right now um, on your screen at home or on your phone, if you just take a screenshot or you can begin to text, just text the word relationships, relationships to the number that you see, 601 601- 397-6111. That'll send you one text back with a link. That's it. And that link will allow you to have access to some resources that we've put together this week to encourage you to read God's word, to pray some things, some things to do, and how to walk in a life of truth in your relationships, to do things God's way. So today, would you take that first step? Would you take that first step of being obedient to trust God? with your relationships, with your life, to put a guard over your mouth in the area of honesty. See, for some of you today, if you were honest, you would have to be real enough to say that you're not doing, not just a part of relationships under God's design, but you're you're not even living life under God's design. And see, there's no hope for relationships until you first align yourself with the creator of all relationships. And so today, maybe you've got questions about what does it mean to really, truly follow Jesus with your life, to walk in that truth, to know the way, the truth, and the life. I mean, we would love to help you, to pray for you, to encourage you with your questions and your spiritual journey. And so if that's you today, there's a way, even as you join us online, for you to simply text your name, just your name, Steve, John, Brittany, whatever your name is, just to text your first name to the number that you see there in our stream. And our ministry teams on the other side today would love to correspond with you just simply through a text message to know how we can pray for you, encourage you. For some of you today, maybe you need somebody just to pray for a broken situation in your life. You can text your name or text the word connect, and that would give you opportunity just to share with our ministry team and our staff team ways that we can know how to love you, pray for you, minister to you in this moment, in this season of your life. Church, listen to me. Relationships can be hard. They don't change overnight. They require constant work, constant trust, love, unity, purity humility, and ultimately honesty. But God's design is always best. But it's up to you and me to walk in obedience according to his truth. And my hope is that this series has challenged you, has encouraged you, and has called you to a place of accountability and trusting God. But may this only be the catalyst for you and I to begin to take next steps to do relationships God's way. Chances are very high you've experienced difficulties in your life because of relationship. Whether it was a friend, co-worker, family member, or spouse, someone has probably caused you some hurt, and truthfully, you've probably caused someone else some hurt. But the Bible is clear. We are not defined by the hurt we cause or the hurt someone has caused us. As a matter of fact, we don't have to be defined by any of the pain that we have experienced. Instead, Jesus invites us into the most important relationship of our life with Him, a relationship that will heal our brokenness and give us the tools to start repairing past broken relationships. What's the cost of it? A willingness to believe Jesus is exactly who Scripture says He is and a willingness to follow Him even when it is difficult. We would love to talk with you about what the relationship with Jesus looks like and to pray with you for whatever is going on in your life. And you can get the conversation started by texting your name to 601-397-6111. Until we gather again, let's all go be the church wherever we go.